There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord. holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord your presence nothing worth more that could ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord. I've tasted sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come blood. glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord I love you Lord for your mercy never fails been held in your hands from 
the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God Let's sing it to the Lord this morning Cause Your goodness is running after It's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me to me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God All oh, my life you have been faithful And all oh, my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God.
four, searching for a better life. We're going to end this thing next week, uh, this series, and I, hopefully you're getting something out of it. And I started to ask, like, how many people remember the homework I gave you the very first week? But I won't do that and put you on the spot. But hopefully, if you haven't been, read through the book of Ephesians, the six chapters. It'll, it'll be nothing to read through in a week. It's pretty easy to do. Read a chapter a day, and you've got a day left that you can do whatever you want to do. Um, but uh, do that. You'll get more out of the series as we go through. But we've been talking about the searching for a better life. And, and today, the, the idea I want to talk to you about is this better life that we're all searching for. Because to be honest with you, I think you probably wouldn't be here. I know I wouldn't have been here at church or wherever if my family or myself down the road hadn't been looking for something better. Because, some, I mean, aren't we all looking for something better? That's why we, we buy new stuff, isn't it? That's why, now, some of, you get, some of the guys in the room, they're like, I still got my clothes from, like, 20 years ago, if it fits. Um, but for most of us, we buy new stuff all the time. The guys just don't waste on clothing. They buy other new stuff, uh, whether it's bullets or whatever they buy. Um, but uh, they still buy new bullets, even though, you're like, why can't you just use the old ones? Yeah. They'll, they'll get that in a minute, but... Um, but we're searching for this better life, but we've been talking about some of the difficulties of searching for this better life. It's been our expectations, it's been our problem, and, and we're really not talking about why people in the world don't come to know Christ. We're talking about why people who came into the church, sometimes they became Christ followers, sometimes they didn't, they just hung out with us for a long time, and then they walked away. Sometimes we get disillusioned, sometimes people change churches, change their thoughts about Christ, and, and I think this week what I want to talk to you about is the issue of trouble. Because a lot of times, one of the biggest issues that, that we get, and, and maybe you were not told this truth when you became a Christ follower, that your troubles don't go away when you become a Christian. And that may be like some of you are like, oh, some of you are going to sit back and go, I knew that, I knew that, it's so disappointing. Um, but we are still looking for it. Even if you knew that, you probably were still looking for something. And at times when you went through difficulties in your life where you had a, a problem, whether it's a health issue or a financial issue or a relationship issue, you sit back and say, God, come on. I've even done that as a pastor. I've sat back at times, I remember, and I've admitted this before, when my mom got taken, uh, taken to, to, uh, to God's presence by cancer, I didn't understand why God would let that happen. I didn't. And I, I, I went to God and said, God... And sometimes you get a little bit, you know, it's okay to ask God why, but you don't question his character. I, I will say that, and I got a little borderline on that, because I, I just accused God of things, and I was stupid and foolish, and I let anger rule my heart. And, and, and I'm just willing to admit it, because I'm just a sinner just like everybody else is. But we often don't like the situations, and we assume God's blessings should always follow, and the blessings should be the blessings that I want, not the blessings that I probably need. And that's the problem. And Paul is addressing this issue because there would be no better time than to address this issue in the first century. Because as bad as you may think you have it, those guys in that first century, they really had it bad. Because they're the, the pathfinders, they're the trailblazers, they're the people that did it first. Because you remember, Christianity is brand new. There was no generation of Christians before them. This is the first people. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of, once again, of Ephesians. That's where we're going to be this whole time. And you can turn it over to chapter 6, and that's where we're going to head out today. But what I want to talk to you about is a word. I would start off with a word that we've heard before, we know, but I'm going to give you a working definition. Because I think what today Paul would tell us as we face these problems, it's the word resilience. And, and for, for sake of a definition, not a textbook definition, not a dictionary definition, the way I would define resilience to you, or resilient in our thinking, is to stand when the winds come against you. And, and, and that's so important we understand what I'm saying here. I, I saw some funny videos. I started to throw a clip in here, and I thought, no, you don't need any more clips or anything like that. But I saw some funny videos of people who tried to stand up in, in, in heavy winds, like hurricane force winds, and, and it, it, was, it, was, it was stupid because it's very hard to do that when those winds are really pushing hard. Um, and, and much less alone when you grab hold of something. I saw a guy grab hold of something. Um, literally, the winds were blowing so hard, he reached out and grabbed hold of a dumpster. And you think, those dumpsters are very heavy. You grabbed hold of it. I, I was thinking how dumb that was when that dumpster started moving. That's how heavy the winds are. And that's a, just a picture of how it is in our lives. And that's what we do sometimes, isn't it? We reach out to grab hold of stuff in our lives that we think is going to be stable, but those things blow away. 
right? We reach out and hold on to our jobs. We hold on to our retirement. We hold on to our 401 whatever um, you got, 401k, and, and uh, mine's more like a, a, a little W or something like that. It's, it's way down the alphabet list. I don't know what it is. Um, I'm not sure it's a 401 either. Um, but anyway, you know, those kind of things, we reach out to those, and, and we, then when they disappear, they get blown away because in this definition, I want you to understand it's when, that word when. I didn't say if winds come. I said when winds come because in everybody here, what we have in common is there will be some winds coming into our life. There will be. And what Paul wants us to understand as we get into this chapter, and he's talked about a lot of different issues, and I could spend years going through all the different issues, which we're not going to do, but he wants us to understand the importance of resilience. And if you're going to have the better life, the life you're really wanting that you think is in blessings, you think is in money, you think is in retirement, you think is in trips, you think is in material stuff, Paul says all that will blow away. What you need is some resilience, and that's what he's going to talk about. us. He wants us to understand the better life would be founded on this basis of this word resilience, the, the, the idea here. And it was so important, as Paul's talking to these, these people in the city of Ephesus, and I want to highlight this, because as he talks about this resilience, he's, using the, he's expanding on the idea here of the battle. We talked about battles last week, but he's expanding on this idea. In fact, he's going to get into some supernatural things here, and we're not going to really spend a lot of time on it. But why was that so important? If you do a study on the town of Ephesus, they had a problem. They were full of a lot of demonic activity, occultic activity. And, and that's, that was just something that was just taken for granted. In fact, if you were to turn, and we're not going to look at it today, but if you want a real interesting story, turn over sometime to the book of Acts in chapter number 19 when, when uh, Paul first goes into the city of Ephesus. There's a lot of idolatry and worship of pagan gods. But there's these seven sons of this guy. He's a Jewish man named Sceva. And, and they're actually, their job, they're like the ghost, ghostbusters of their time. They're the demon busters, I guess you could say it. They were going around casting out demons. And they caught on to this whole routine, and, and they were doing it as a, a money-making venture. But they were going around, and what they were doing is they were using Paul's name, because Paul was being very successful, and Paul had done some amazing things. But they're going around using Paul's name and Jesus' name. And the story in Acts chapter 19 comes around, and, and you can imagine just the town of Ephesus, this would have been something like folklore. This would have been something, everybody talks about this. And that's what Paul's going to use. If you keep this in your mind, you're going to understand a little bit more what Paul's talking about here. Because the story goes that these seven sons, they come into this guy who's demon-possessed, which is a scary proposition here, something that we probably don't really understand a whole lot about. Okay, you may think your kids are demon-possessed, and I can have an amen there if you want to, but... Not necessary, but this was a real demon, and I don't want to laugh it off. This was a real spiritual problem here. And these seven sons, seven grown men come in, and they're going to cast out this demon, and so they're using Paul's name. They command this demon to come out of him in Paul's name and in Jesus' name. And the demon looks at these guys, these, these guys, before he jumps on them and beats them and strips them naked and has them running home to mommy, that's how it goes. That's the funny part of the story, I guess. But he looks at him and he says, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who in the world are you guys? And then he jumps on them, rips them down, strips them naked, which in that culture is the same as our today. But that culture, to be naked, if you stripped your foe naked, you were embarrassing him. The two things they always did, like you would, you would strip a guy naked and you would shave off his beard. And those are the two major things to cause shame on somebody. And that's what this demon does. He doesn't shave them, but he, he strips them naked and they go running. And so that's the backdrop of what's going on in this city, this town, these kind of demonic things. So when Paul says this, and by the way, as Paul's going to begin this, and I haven't gotten to our scripture yet, but Paul's going to say, these are my final words. And when he says, finally, and you'll find that in our passage that we're going to read, he says, finally, he's not going like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I meant to tell you this. You know how we do that. He's not doing that at all. Paul's going, I want to reinforce everything that I've taught you up here and wrap it up in a final thought. And, and here's what I would say. Final thoughts are always the most important thoughts, aren't they? The final word that somebody's given you, and they're not just a passing thing. So Paul, when he says this, he's saying, let me draw everything that I've been talking about for the last several chapters. Let me wrap it up here because I want you to get something. So today's lesson, I'm glad you're here. Today's message is vitally important to us. 
And Paul is helping us understand that we really need to have this resilience. Because this is why the people in Ephesus were paying attention, because they understood when Paul says, hey, you need the spiritual armor of God. He wasn't just using a pretty metaphor that we use and like, oh, that's so cool. No, they were thinking about the seven sons of Sceva who got stripped down naked by a demon in their town and other demonic activity. And they knew this isn't just legend. This is real stuff. Probably a lot of them knew these, these kids. And so this was a real deal. So when Paul starts talking about be strong, stand up, be resilient for this life that you need, it wasn't just a ho-hum, this is great, preacher, good words. No, this is, wow, write this down because Paul's going, hey, this is how it works in your life. You don't want to get stripped naked. You don't want to be ashamed. You don't want to be the next victim of a demon that comes along down the road. And, and the idea that we have to understand here, and the point I want to make, and this is where Paul's really wrapping up things, is to understand this. The gospel is the power of God in your life. And you say, of course it is. Paul said that over in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, but what he's doing now, is, without saying those exact words, he's demonstrating it. He's saying, hey, Christian, and we're not talking to unsaved people once again. So if you're not, you're not a Christ, well, it's okay. You're off the hook. Just sit back and listen, and maybe you'll get something out of it. But Christian, Paul is going to say some things today, and he really is reinforcing them in a very strong language. And he's wanting us to understand the gospel is not just some good news. He says the gospel is the power of God. And you know what? We often go through life being so powerless. And Paul's going to tell us why. He says, you know what? The gospel is the power of God in your life. It's the way that God reverses the corruption of sin in your life. It's the, it's the way that God repels the power of Satan in your life. It's the antidote that keeps death from eroding your life. It's the shield that keeps Satan from manipulating your life. It is. It's the gospel. It's not a bunch of hooey bluey. It's not ambulance. It's not all the crazy stuff the world would tell you. It is the power of God. And what he wants us to understand here, that we have to take this power of God, this gospel, and he's using this metaphor of armor as he talks about it, and he says, hey, take this armor and cover every part of your life with it. I could just pray and go home now, and that would be good, but we're not going to. <laughs> Some of you wish we would. But I'm telling you, it is that serious. That's what Paul's saying. And I don't know how many times I've heard this, this passage preached on today and just sat back and heard the same old, same old, and, and, and never let the power of this thought get through because I just sort of remember the old metaphors of armor and thinking, that's so outdated. And Paul's using his analogy and his time thinking about demon activity, thinking about Satan and his attacks on us. And he's saying, wrap yourself up in the gospel because it's the power of God. And what we have to realize is the way we keep the corrupting influence of the enemy out of our lives is by establishing every part of our life. That is, our hopes. Got any hopes? Our dreams, our failures, our worries, our fears, our relationships, our pleasures disappointments wrap every part of our life up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if that's true, the flip side is also true. And this is where the problem sits in, right? The flip side is true that whatever part of you is not established in the gospel of Jesus Christ, whatever part of you is not saturated, that's probably a better word, whatever part of you is not saturated in the gospel of Jesus Christ is subject to manipulation by the enemy against you. And that's what Paul is warning. So what is he telling us? Paul is saying this. Saturate yourself. If the gospel is the power of God in your life, then saturate yourself with the gospel. That's the point. Saturate yourself with the gospel. I mean, let, let your life be marinated in the truth of all the things he's told us up to this point. And we're not just talking about salvation here. The gospel is good news for every aspect of your life. And I think we just sort of, we sell the gospel so short when we just talk about that one aspect of prayer, prayer, and you're done. The gospel is for your entire life. The gospel is good news for eternity. And that's what we have to understand. That's what Paul's urging these people so that they don't get defeated. So that they don't walk away going, I was looking for a better life, but problems overwhelm me. Because I know a lot of Christians that they put their hope in politics. And when their guy doesn't win, they go around complaining, but they can't get past politics. I know a lot of people who, 
hey, you know what? They put their hope in medicine, but when they get sick, or they get something like cancer or COVID or whatever, they think the world's coming to an end because they haven't saturated themselves with the gospel of Jesus Christ and they have no power. And, 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 and Paul knew this so well, not because he was an experienced, strong person, but because Paul understood it's the armor of God against Satan. It, it has to be saturated with the gospel, that is, to be filled with the mind of Christ, to be, uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, is to be filled with the Spirit and, and resistant to the attacks of Satan. That's what Paul's point is. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to pick up and we're going to read chapter 6, beginning in verse number 10. You can either, if you don't have the Bible with you, you can either slide over next to somebody who hopefully is going to be nice enough to share, or you can just read on screen. If you're like, I don't want to be near somebody, Okay. He starts off by saying this in chapter 6, verse 10, and I hopefully have given you the idea of what's going to happen. He says, finally. Final words are important, aren't they? I already said this. You ever, you ever had a surgery or gone to a major important doctor? Maybe you had some teeth pulled, like your wisdom teeth or something like that, and the doctors gave you instructions pre-surgery, right? Anybody ever had anything like that? Right? Okay. Those are probably pretty important to do. I knew, a, I knew a, I, seriously, I knew a guy who had, was going to have his wisdom teeth out, and they gave him all the instructions, and he probably told him that, but he isn't a good lister like most guys. And um, I admit it. <laughs> I expect a few ladies going, amen there. Good preaching. But, but the problem was, he, he <laughs> okay, back up here. Final words, he was going to have his teeth, wisdom teeth pulled out, had a schedule, but he didn't listen, and he didn't read the paperwork. And, you know, they told him after 9 o'clock, don't eat or drink anything. So he gets there the next morning, and he was having problems, like painful problems with these teeth anyway. That's why I needed them out. And he had been waiting to schedule this. You know how waiting for doctors and all that gets just so irritating sometimes. Got it scheduled, and you know what? He showed up after he had stopped by and had breakfast on the way there, like a dummy. Who doesn't know that? But he didn't know that. He shows up, so you know one, they're going through their checklist of questions for prep. And they go, "Have you eaten or drank anything since nine o'clock last night?" And he goes, "Absolutely. Had my had my morning coffee. Had my had had a good old breakfast." He started talking about the eggs and the biscuits and gravy and all those things he had. And the, the lady just put down her clipboard. And she goes. Okay, so I'm going to send you back out so you can reschedule. And he's like, you're kidding me. And, and my point is, is, final instructions are pretty important here, and that's what Paul wants us to understand. So think of this as final instructions in your faith. Here he goes. He says, finally, not as in a side note, I forgot to tell you this, let me wrap it up. He's saying, no, I want to stress the importance of everything I've told you, but I'm going to wrap it up in a nutshell. He says, be strong. And that's the title for today, be strong. Pretty easy to find. He says, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He goes on to say in verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse number 12, he says, and he's going to tell us who this devil is and, and, and not really all the people who work for the devil. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And we've talked about this in other series before. I want to reinforce this, though. So often the problems we have in life seem to be physical, but 99% of them aren't physical. They're actually manifested in the physical realm, but they're spiritual problems. And this is another one of those passages that Paul's telling us that. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Hey, you may have people that really irk you. You may have people that you really can't stand. You may think they're, they're relatives or they're your in-laws or they're outlaws or whoever they are. They may be your, hey, maybe your old spouse. I hope not. Maybe your kids, maybe your parents' kids, maybe your boss. But what Paul's saying, it's not really. It's not really. The problems you have are just manifestations in those people, but they're a deeper problem because the problems you have, our struggle is against, and notice how many times he's going to use that word against, is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the, the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, he says, you're in a whole different place. It's a lot worse than you thought it was. And that's what Paul, and he's not exaggerating. He's giving you this whole idea of, man, you've got to struggle here. In verse 13, he goes on to say, therefore, and remember whatever therefore is in the Bible, you've got to say, what is it therefore? So he's giving you, it's, it's a conclusionary 
draw of the first couple of verses that we just read. He says, therefore, because of all those things, because you have a battle, because you have struggles, because you need to put on this armor, he goes and says it again. He says, put on the full armor of God. So that when, when, if you take notes in your Bible, I would circle that word, not if. He didn't say if. He said, when, when the day of evil comes, and it is coming, if it hasn't gotten to you already, there are going to be a lot of day, evil days. We live in an evil world full of evil days. He says, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. That's resilience, right? Stand against those gale force winds. Stand against the things that are knocking you down. Stand against the hurricanes, the, the tornadoes. Stand against the hardships. He says, you'll be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, in verse 14, he says, stand firm then. And he goes on, and you say, well, why didn't we read the rest of the verse? I'm not going to get into all the different parts. That, that's a whole different sermon that would take me months to go through, um, and that's not really what we're going to talk about today. But he goes through, and he lists, and I encourage you to go as you read through the book of Ephesians, read through those parts, because he talks about the armor of God. But what he's trying to get us to understand here in this passage here is that we need, it's a twofold thing. He wants us to be prepared for something and be prepared to do something. Be prepared for something, be prepared to do something. And it's obvious what he wants us to do. He wants us to be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. That's the difficulty there. To engage in life's battles is what he's saying to engage in every struggle you have, and you probably have a lot of, and we could sit here all day long and talk about the various struggles we have, whether physically, whether financially, whether relationally, all these different struggles. I mean, some of you got road rage just driving here today, and you know there was a lot of struggles in that on a Sunday too, by the way. Isn't that crazy? We struggle in everything. And he says, hey, you know what? If we're going to engage in our struggles, make sure you engage in your struggles not from a uh, position of weakness, but a position of strength. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Everybody say that with me. It's, 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 and say it that way. Be strong in the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Don't you feel stronger when you say it like that? In fact, if you do the hand thing, I'm, I'm serious. Do you know this? One of the things they teach public speakers is the Superman pose, if you have nerves before you get up to give a speech or anything like that, I don't do this because I don't usually have this issue, but um, I, I know people that do this. Do the Superman pose. <sighs> no, in the back room, not out in public. <laughs> and that encourage, it really does, it plays something with your psyche about like being able to, because the, the number one fear people have is public speaking. Do that pose. And I was thinking, you know, be strong in the Lord. Do you feel that strength? It's, it's hey, why do, we, why do we, like, fear so many things then? Because we're not. See, what Paul is saying here when he says this, and what the, what the gospel is teaching is counterintuitive. Why? Because the interpretation that we have is be strong in how I do everything for myself. Be strong in how I work my job. Be strong in how I save my money. Be strong in my relations with everybody. Be strong in my activities. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with those things. But you're so weak, it won't make a difference. See, Paul says, if you put your strength in yourself, you fail. Be strong in the Lord. That's what's counterintuitive. And, and we have a struggle because our American culture, that's the exact opposite of how we are. I'm just saying, that's his. I, you need any help? Uh, no, I don't need any help. I do it myself. I do it myself. And, and we're not telling each other that. We do tell each other that. But really, who we tell the most is God. And that's what Paul's saying here. Hey, stop trying to do these. You won't win a battle by yourself. You cannot stand against the winds by yourself. He says, be strong in the Lord. Engage your battles from a position of strength. Don't be strong in yourself. Be strong in the Lord. Let him be the strength and power and security in every area of your life. Every area of your life. And that's difficult. That's where I sit back and go, Whoo, wait a minute. See, I don't have a problem when you say, be strong in the Lord in church on Sunday. Right? It's easy to say amen in here, isn't it? But when I face people out there, 
whole different ballgame. When we start talking about politics, when we start talking about money, we start talking about this work, uh, I don't know if I can be strong in the Lord. I've got to be strong in me now. And we sort of compartmentalize and we put it off. And that's what Paul's saying. Hey, the problem is wrap yourself up in the gospel because the gospel is the power of God in your life. That's the idea here. And, and, and what Paul is saying here, and this is, the, this is our struggle here, you cannot be strong in yourself and be strong in God. You can't. And that's the difficulty. This is the, the fight. If you were to go over to the book of Romans, which we're not going to go there today, but if you were to go to the book of Romans, Paul talks about this in chapter 7. He says, you know, there's a struggle within me about the things I want to do. He says, the person I am inside me knows that there are things I shouldn't do, but those are the things I find myself doing all the time. Anybody else identify with that? I do. And he says, I know the things that God wants me to do, the things I should do, and you know what? Those are the things that so often I find myself not doing. And he's saying there's a struggle. Just within my own life, there's a struggle. And what he wants us to understand, and this is what Paul came to, this is why Paul was so great in this aspect. He understood his weakness and said, you know what? I am weak. He is strong. That's what the, and, and I know you say, well, that's easy. Yeah, easily said, not easily practiced. Because you can't be strong in yourself and be strong in God. And you know what the church is full of? We've got a lot of people that try to be strong Christians. Stop trying to be a strong Christian and make God strong. I, I, you say, well, what? Yeah, see, the, the problem is, is we try to be super strong Christians. We do. That's how I was taught. Be a strong Christian. Paul's not saying for you to be a strong Christian. You know what he's saying? Make God strong in your life. Put God in a power uh, strength in your life. Wrap yourself up in him. You can be as weak as you want to be, but have him strong. That's what he's saying here. Put on the full armor of God. He didn't say, hey, muscle up so you can wear that armor. He didn't say that. He didn't say build up yourself. to. No, he's saying be strong in God. Be strong in God. And what he does, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. When he does this, he says there's some things that you can expect. And, the, and I started, I, t- I told Tracy, I said, had I, had I thought about this, I might have retitled this, uh, which the title doesn't really matter. Instead of being strong, I might have retitled this in great, as great expectations. Because I think there's a lot of great expectations we can find here that Paul would draw, us, uh, draw our attention to. And that's what I want to talk about today. The first of those that he would tell us is that we should expect skirmish. Expect a skirmish. And, and you say, well, what, what? Now, that's a fancy word for battle, right? I just wanted to use the letter S, though. So uh, I know I'm just weird on that. I hate when I do that, but expect a battle. In fact, I would say we should have made it, I should have made not a skirmish, but skirmishes. Or like the old guy who, who was talking about his marriage that he had lasted for all these years, somebody said, hey, you ever had any fights? And he said, just one. And they said, that's amazing. In all the years he'd been married, like 70 years, you've only had one, ba- one fight all your life, all these years. That's amazing. How'd you do it? And he goes, he said, how'd you, the guy asked him, how'd you get past it? And the old guy looked at him and said, I don't know. I'll let you know when it's over. <laughs> that's how our Christian life is. I know that's a bad joke, and you probably heard it a hundred times, but, and I didn't even tell it good. But I want you to know this. Your Christian life is a battle every day, every moment of the day. There's not a time when it's not a battle. It is a full-on war, and that's what Paul's telling us here. He says in verse number 10, if you go back to verse number 10, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You know why he's telling you that? Because every day is going to be a battle, every day. And yet we wake up some days thinking like, I don't know why this is so hard. I don't understand. I don't understand why it's so hard to read my Bible. I don't understand why it's difficult to find time to pray. I just don't understand why it's so hard to get to to Bible studies and go to church and all those things. It's not hard for me to go on vacation, but it's hard for me to do those things. Right? Right? And you know what Paul would say? It's because you're not expecting a battle. It is. The reason why the life doesn't seem to be a better life that you're searching for is because you didn't expect a battle. And that's why so many people walk away from this Christianity because we don't think it's going to be a battle. Because someone lied to us years ago and said, give your heart to Jesus, give your heart to Jesus, and it would be all puppy dogs and butterflies and stuff like that. And that was a lie. 
Jesus didn't even say that. Jesus said, hey, in this world you're going to have, he used the word tribulation. And that's probably a word you don't use a lot, but what he's saying is you're going to have a lot of heavy-duty problems. But he didn't stop. You know what's great about it? He didn't stop there. He said, in this world, this would be a big dinner. In this world, you will have tribulation. And if he had put a period there, we would all walked away going, I don't know if I want to be a Christ follower. But he didn't stop there. He said, but be of good cheer, be happy, be ecstatic, because I have overcome the world. And that's the point Paul is really reinforcing here. He's saying it in a different way. He's saying, circle the gospel around you. It's, it's what's going to help you. The gospel is the power of God in your life. The gospel is the power of God in your life. And when your problems overwhelm you, you know what you're not living in? Say it. The gospel. Come on. It's obvious. I know it's not hard. And when we do these things, and that's because we are so weak, and, and that's just another indication we're weak. And I, I, so you don't have to feel bad about those things. What you have to do is go, hey, it's so right. Because when I fail and I get so upset because I fail, it's just an indication that he is right, that I'm weak, and I just need to put God around me because God's strong and he's offering to be strong for us. In fact, he's offering to let me be strong in him. That's what he's saying there in verse 10. Don't wait to get kicked in the teeth. Don't wait to get beaten down by everything around you. You have to be prepared for the difficulties. You have to be prepared for the skirmish. You have to be prepared for the attack. And yet we often don't prepare for those things. And Paul says, and remember who he's talking to, he's talking to these Ephesians, lots of, lots of demon activity and things like that, and it was real to them. And Paul would tell them, hey, you know why you need to be prepared for skirmishes, be prepared for the battle? Because Satan is real. The devil's real. C.S. Lewis put it really well, and I didn't want to quote a long quote out of him, but C.S. Lewis basically said there's two problems in the church. And this is, you got to realize, this is years ago he said this. He said, two problems in the church. He said, the church either underestimates Satan ridiculously or they get so enthralled with him that they give him too much credit. And that's the truth. We need to find that happy medium. But I want you to know, even though you don't live in, in a time where you see maybe a lot of satanic, you know, we can all come up with a few stories here. But maybe you haven't really re recognized satanic activity the way it is. That's part of Satan's deception here. But Satan is real. And Paul described him as an enemy there in chapter 6, verse 12. He, he tells us who they are, remember? He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities. And notice he keeps using that word against. Against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and, and the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm, realms. And, and he wants us to understand the devil's real. But I want you to know... Satan is not after your recognition. He's after your destruction. He doesn't care if you acknowledge him or not. He wants to destroy you. In fact, he, he would rather you not acknowledge him. And that's so important for us. But not only is he real, but he would tell you, you know what? The devil's not only real, but he's relentless. He's coming after you. Four times, four times in the descriptions there, Paul used that word against. I pointed that out several times. And, and he's using it in front of every one of the descriptions for our enemy to make the point of what we're really up against. He, he says, you're not up against those people that you think you're up against. You're not up against Democrats if you're a Republican or Republicans if you're a Democrat. You're not up against them. But you keep focusing on them because you're wrong. You're up against Satan. You're up against, hey, you're not up against the bars. You're not up against all these other things in town. He said, you know what you're up against? You're up against Satan and his powers and his forces. They're working the worst. And you know how you defeat him? The gospel armor on you. That's exactly it. I know. I was waiting. I figured some of you catch up there for a minute. And he says, but you don't do that if you don't expect a battle. And so often, the church of the 21st century, you know why we're failing? Didn't expect a battle. Didn't expect a war. I thought it was going to be smooth sailing, easy. I thought my marriage was going to be, you know, marriages fall apart. You know why? Didn't expect the battle. Satan's after destroying your marriage. He's after destroying your family. You know why? Hey, we expect our kids just to raise themselves and be good. Doesn't work that way, does it? Expect our jobs to work out like that, right? Expect everything to, it doesn't work that way. Paul says be intentional. 
And when you expect that, not just expect skirmishes, but expect the schemes. Expect schemes is the second thing he tells us there. He, he, he says, you know what? You have to stand strong. Verse number 11, he says, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And you know what that tells me right off the bat? Satan has a plan for your destruction. Satan has a plan for your destruction. Look at the person next to you and say, Satan has a plan for your destruction. I mean, if you don't believe that, you're foolish. I'm just telling you, Satan has a plan. He has schemes, multiple schemes there. He has a plan for your destruction. This week, you may not have thought a, a, a minute about anything you're doing this week, but he has. He's got principalities and powers, and he's got rulers, and he's got all kinds of people that he's sending your way with a plan of how to destroy you. That's really C.S. Lewis's old point when he writes that book, The Screwtape Letters. He wants you to understand if you ever want to take time, it's a, it, it might not be the easiest read, but that's what he is. It's a, it's a, it's a story of, that he was thinking about how Satan would plan out or his demons would plan out how they're going to take you down. Gives you a lot of insight. He did a good job on that. And you know, the devil's got a scheme that's just set for you. He wants you to understand, and, and, and my point is the schemes are all around you. They're at, they're at your work. They're in your car. They're in the car next to you. They're in your home. Yeah. Satan lays a trap that you're going to walk right. I, you know what? I can tell you that because I walk into them all the time. You want to know why you fight with your spouse sometimes? Because you walked into a scheme that Satan laid for you. And you were dumb enough to think you weren't going to have any tax of your problems at home. It's true. And you know what Paul's saying here? Don't miss what he's saying. He's saying, wrap yourself up in the power of God, the gospel, because it's the power of God in your life. It is. I'm going to keep telling you that, and hopefully it'll sink in. That's what he wants. He says, you know what? You've got to be watchful of these spiritual landmines. They're all around us. Throughout the Bible, it talks about things like heresies. Those are things that, that change the belief about who God is. Seductions, material allurements, self-pity. We do that a lot. Blame shifting, self-justification, redefining what good and evil is. Uh, and, and, and you know those things, all those things, and I could sit here, just keep going with this list forever, but all those things come, you know when they come to us? Those things come to us when we're tired and we're weak and we're not paying attention because that's the best time to plan a trap, right? To plan a scheme. And Satan knows it. He knows you. He knows. And so what Paul's saying here, you don't have to worry about it because I know some of us are like, I've got to be on guard 24 hours a day. No, you don't. You need to wrap yourself up with the gospel of God because it's the power of your life, and God will be on guard 24 hours a day. See, when you th- say, I've got to be on guard 24 hours a day, you know what you're saying? I've got to be strong. And he, not what you have to be. God's strong. God's strong. I just need to wrap myself up in God. That's what he's trying to get us to understand here. He wants us to understand that because Satan, though he's not omnipotent, omniscient, or omnipresent, Satan has a wide array of of allurements, an arsenal of weapons at his disposal that he wants to use on you. So you need to be prepared. And you get prepared not by your own strength, but by wrapping yourself up in the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God in your life. Not only should we expect those things, but we should expect, he says, that we should expect uh, to struggle. Now you say, well, wait a minute. I thought you said, isn't this the same thing as the battle, the skirmish? No, no, no. It's a little bit different here. If you go to verse number 12, the beginning of verse number 12, he says this in chapter 6. He says, for our struggle. And I highlight those words because he's saying something different here. He's not talking about the battle now. The battle's around us all the time. That's why you have to have the armor of God. That's why you have to have the power of God. But now he's saying our struggle, and he's telling you that you will struggle. You will personally struggle. He's, he's pointing out the fact that you're weak. I'm weak. And he says, our struggle everybody's got to struggle, and that's what he wants us to do. He, he knows that we're going to expect this attack because that's why he tells us to put armor on, but he says, hey, even though you have armor, you're going to have to still struggle. And what, what we want to get out of this understanding here and this expectation to struggle is that there is an expectation of our own efforts here. Now, up to this point, I've told you everything's on God, but God expects us to do some things. God, and when he tells us this in, in twice now, if you were to look back, in verse 11 and verse 13, it almost you see, like, is he being redundant? He says, put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. 
And that term put on, what he's trying to get us to understand is there are some responsibility to our actions. There are some consequences. Effort is required of us. Effort is required of us. As a coach, my favorite, favorite phrase to say as a coach to our players, if they wanted to win, because you know what? In the hot sun, nobody wanted to go out and practice hard, practice long, practice for hours. Nobody wanted to do that. Nobody wanted to run suicides, man makers, whatever you want to call them. Nobody wanted to do any of those things. They'd rather sit around and eat chips and, and act like it's a goofball time. But I said, if you want to win, you want to win, I want to win. I said, the, co- the, the team always said, yeah, I want to win, coach. I want to win. What do we need to do? If you want to win, effort is everything. If you want to win, effort is everything. And that's what Paul's saying here. You're going to have struggles, and you're going to have to make the choice of wrapping yourself up in the arm of God. Now, the arm of God will do its work. But you know what, where we fail? Well, I didn't realize God wants me to read his word. God wants me to spend time conversing with him. I didn't realize I should go to Bible study. I didn't realize I should go to church. I didn't realize I should do those things. That's a drag because i got my own things I want to do. Failure. That's where we struggle. And Paul says, hey, you know what? You need to expect to struggle. That's one of the hardships. And, and I think that's one of the things that is so negative sometimes about the Christian life. You got to you got to put some effort into it. You got you got to do some things. The the psalmist used the term over and over. You'll see it in the Psalms. The term is sila. And the best explanation of sila would be if I had a farmer here that could talk to me talk to you about the cows chewing their cud, because that's the best explanation of, of sila. He's saying these thoughts I just gave you, sila, take them. Chew them up in your mind, swallow them, and a little later down the road, vomit it back up into your mouth and eat it again. And a little bit later, vomit it back up into your mind, eat it again. And if we would just seal up, if we would just chew over and over, dwell on the word of God, let it dwell in us richly is how Paul put it. If we would just wrap ourselves up in the gospel, hey, we realize our struggles are struggles, but you know what? God helps us through our struggles. And that's what we have to understand. Expect it. We need to understand there is an effort applied here. And when he says put on in the original languages, in verse 11 and verse 13, that is in imperative mode. Imperative mode, that would be simply a command. It's not like, hey, if you feel like it, if the weather's right and you don't have anything better to do. No, Paul's not speaking from that. He's speaking under the power of God. And he says, hey, Christian, soldier, better life is only through putting on, so get dressed. Put on. Put on the whole armor of God. Expectation when we put on the whole armor of God is to expect strength, and that's the next one. We should expect strength. In verse number 11, he tells us, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. And you know what? When you, when you understand what he's saying there, he's saying, without the armor of God, you can't take your stand. You get that? Without the armor of God, without the gospel wrapped around me, you can't stand at all. The power of God brings you strength, and that's what the expectation is. As a child of God, as I wrap myself up in the full armor of God, when I put the gospel, the power of God for my life around me, then I can take that stand. Otherwise, I'm going to fall over. The winds will knock me down every time. I am just like that toddler trying to walk, and I just wobble, wobble, wobble all the time. And you know what? Wobbly Christians aren't good. That's the expectation. God's sovereignty here is what he's trying to help us understand. When God says, hey, I'm wrapped around you, there's nothing going to knock you down. That's what he's saying here. it, It assumes God's initiative, too, that God's given you strength. It assumes the the God's involvement, that God is passing his strength to you. The exhortation is God's invitation to stand, to persevere, to remain faithful to Christ and his gospel, which brings us to the next expectation, which is the expectation to stand. Now that you have the strength that's given to you by God, there's an expectation that you'll stand, which brings us to that whole idea of why are we sitting if, if God says stand? Why we sit around, I, I think about the, uh, the lepers story over in the book of Kings where the city is surrounded under siege by a, a great force. And these lepers, are, everybody's starving themselves to death. It was gross in there. They're eating some nasty stuff. 
even, even cannibalistic uh, tendencies. And these lepers who have nothing to live for because they're dying anyway. They look at each other and say, you know what? We ought to go out and see if they'll give us something to eat because what's the difference if we're going to die here or die by their hand? In fact, it might be merciful if they kill us. And, and, and so they decide, we don't do well if we just sit here. And they go out there and they find that God's cleared out the army and they're hoarding everything, they're eating, and all of a sudden they look at each other and go, wait a minute. Perplexity here. I can keep it to myself, but not tell anybody, or there's a whole city starving to death in there. And they say, we don't do well if we just keep it ourselves. We got to get up and do something. And they go back and they tell the news to the king and save the town because they... They spread the word. And I think that's what Paul's saying here. There's an expectation for us to get up, Christian, to get up. He says, verse number 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. And there again, that's an option, uh, even though it's a command, it's an option that some people don't take. And you know why we don't take it? Some people walk away from Christian, Christianity. Some people walk away because Christians aren't very good. Churches aren't always good. But the truth of the matter is a lot of times they're looking for something else. And the definition they have of better life isn't what they thought it would be. And Paul's saying, hey, you're going to be given the strength, but you got to do it. You just got to do it. You got to stand up. Paul's concern is Christian stability here. That's the whole idea. See, wobbly Christians who don't have a firm foothold in Christ Jesus are easy prey for the devil. That's, that's the hard thing. It, it, this is not a call to stand here idle when he says stand, by the way, to stand around and do nothing, stand around with my friends and have talks. He's saying, you know what, get up and do something about it. It's this firm stand against the schemes of the devil is what he says there if you read that whole verse. He says, take your stand against those schemes, those problems. Stand up. He says, don't give up what's been given to you. And I think about what he gave us. Paul, as he's laid out this in, in the book of Ephesians, in chapters 1 and 2, he gave us assurance of salvation. In chapters 2 and 3, he talks about the uniqueness that we have in the body of Christ. In chapter 4, he talks about a renewed mind and a renewed manner of living. And he talks about the fact that we have been enabled to walk as children of God, revealing the light of our Father in chapter 5 of Ephesians. We've been called into this radical relationship of marriage talks about the relationships of the home and, and the relationships of work in chapters 5 and 6 that are blessed by God when we practice the way God intends them to. And, and you know what he's saying here? These are the things you have to take a stand in. Take a stand by putting on this full armor of God. And when you do that, it leads us to the truth of the next expectation that we should expect the Savior. Expect the Savior. See, the command there in chapter 13, the very beginning, is to put on the full armor of God. The full armor of God. And that is not the full armor of yourself. He says, put on the full armor of God. It is the armor of God. That means we're going to see the Savior. This is, a nece this is necessary if we stand. It's necessary if we're going to be strengthened by God to put on his armor. See, what Paul is really trying to get us to understand is that we're supposed to be dressed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the point of this whole thing. Dressed in the, whole, in the Lord Jesus Christ. To put on the, the armor of God, and we get so caught up in the, the, the metaphor that we forget, what he's really saying is, put on Jesus Christ. Put on Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, look, look to, to Jesus. Keep believing the gospel. He's promised to save you from your sins. We're to be clothed in him. We're to put on Christ. That's what he's saying. In fact, he says it better than this, and I don't, I, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to give you these verses. Romans chapter 13 and verse number 11. He says this, he says, and do this. And, and think about how this is almost similar to what he's saying here. He says, and do this, understanding the present time. And we saw this back in chapter 4 and 5 where he talks about knowing the days. The days are evil, right? He says, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep, from your slumber, because our salvation is near. Now, when he talks about that, he's talking about, the aspect of the completed salvation. You've been given a down payment on your salvation, the, the earnestness of the Holy Spirit's in you, but it hasn't fully been completed because we still live in sin. And he's saying, hey, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. He says, you know what? The day of Jesus Christ bringing us to his presence, glorifying us, and erasing the sin 
of our sinful flesh is coming. And it's closer today than it was the first day you believed. That's a good thing. But he goes on to say this. He goes on, verse number 12, he says, the night is nearly over. Because you live in darkness. Remember, that's what he's been telling us there in Ephesians. The, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And, and he's going to explain this in the next verse. Verse 13, he says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness. Go on, uh, verse number 13. He says, not in sexual immorality. And all th these things are all the things we just got done talking about in Ephesians, right? He says, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Those are things, and by the way, just, just pause there for a second. He's not talking to the people that are not Christians. He's talking to Christians here. That was a problem that Christians are getting drunk, practicing immorality, practicing all these things. And he says, don't do those things. Rather, and this is it, verse 14, here it is. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's my point, isn't it? Clothe yourself in the gospel armor. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. We've got to stop thinking about me, 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 what I want, my vacations, my entertainment, my material possessions, my stuff, my, my, my. He says, put that, that's when you're at the worst. That's when you're trying to make yourself strong. Make yourself strong in the Lord. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what he's saying there. And as we sink into who we are in Christ, we'll be strengthened for our struggles for this battle we'll be able to be strong, which leads us to the last expectation. You should expect to succeed. <laughs> That's hope, isn't it? That's good. We don't have to expect to lose. We need to expect to succeed, to win. In fact, at the end of verse 13, he says, you may be able to stand. That's why you're doing all this, that you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. And he talks about that armor once again. And he's going to give it a detailed explanation about what every piece does in the parts of your life. But he says the whole point is not the detailed explanation. It's that you need to stand firm in the armor of God wrapped up in you. We need to expect to succeed. You know what the biggest problem? You know the difference between a winner and a loser is? I think last week I, I said something. Kathy reminded me I said something about, like, I, I play to win. Um, and that can be, that can be a, a, a big weakness, too, by the way. Um, I'm not, uh, my wife would tell you some of the bad things I've done um, trying to, to win everything. Um, competitive nature is good, taken too far. Your, your greatest strengths taken to a, the farthest degree are your biggest weaknesses. If you didn't know that, it is true. Um, perfectionist, biggest weakness, perfectionism. It is. So whatever your biggest strength is taken way too far is your biggest weakness. And your friends can tell you, by the way, they know it. Um, and, and, and they probably won't tell you, but... They do know. But here's what I'm saying. <sighs> hate to lose. I don't play games to have a good time. <laughs> now, you can have that pious little, like, I only play to have a good time. That's great. But when I'm competing in something, I'm playing to win. Hey, I, when I turn on a game, I don't want to watch a team lose, especially my team. It makes me mad. I've played a game. Uh, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I, I don't play to lose. I play to win. And God wants us to play to win in the right way. Now, that, there again, I can take that too far. But here's the good news. In life, I want to win in life, don't you? I want to win in life, don't you? Absolutely. That's why I'm here. That's why I read this book. That's why I pray. And God says, you know what the great motivation is? You don't have to expect problems that you may or may not come out of the winter. He says, expect to succeed. Expect to stand. Hey, you know what? If I had a 50-50 chance of following these instructions that I just gave you today, that Paul said, that I may or may not succeed, I'd say hooey bluey on it, right? 50-50 is not good enough for me. Is it for you? Next time you go out car car shopping to buy a car, and you pick out a car, and you ask the guy about the car, and he says, yeah, half the time it starts, half the time it doesn't. You buying that car? I mean, brand new off the lot, you going to buy that car? No, I'm not. Our expectations is that it should succeed in being a car. Then why is your expectation not always to succeed in the spiritual life? 
And you know what God's expectation is? That you will succeed. He didn't say, I hope that you could stand. You may be able to stand. He says, when you've done what you're supposed to do and you put yourself wrapped up in the armor of God, do you get what he's saying? You will stand. You will stand, no doubt about it. And that's great news. Because I'm tired of losing. That's what my life was before Christ. It was just losing everything. Lose it relationships. Lose it, you name it. Lose, 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 lose. And you know why so many of us, we blame God for those losses because we didn't wrap ourselves up in the gospel of Christ. God, you didn't give me health. You didn't give me this. You didn't give me that. First of all, he never promised those things. But number two, your expectations are the wrong expectations. He told you to win if you be strong in him. And I want you to get this as we finish out. This is a command. It's a command. It is. And more than anything, that rubs us wrong. It is. I, you can admit to it. As, as Americans, we don't like people telling us what to do. I get it. That's one of our struggles. <sighs> but it is a command. I told you that. It's imperative. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a struggle that we have to follow these commands, but it's a command. That's the good thing. But you know what? It's also a caution. Paul's saying, I'm telling you, it's not just to give you another checklist thing on Christianity. I'm not doing that. It's moralism. I'm trying to help you here because it's a caution. Because there is a devil who is designed to defeat you. And he <coughs> will stop you in your marriage. He'll stop you in your work relationships. He'll stop you every... He'll, he'll stifle your Christian life when you don't follow the command. But you know what's great about this? It's not just a command. It's not just a caution. It's a comfort. And that's what Paul wants it to be. As he finishes it out, he's saying, hey, comfort yourself. And it's hard to find comfort in thinking about putting on some armor. But when you think about it, not as the armor that we spend so much time metaphoring, but you think about it as putting on Jesus Christ. He says, what better comfort can you have? Because he's always going to be there. Remember what he told his disciples? In the last days before he, he leaves them, he says, I am with you always, always, even unto the very end of time, the age. That's comfort. So what does God want from you? Simply this. Be strong. But not in yourself. Wrap yourself up in the gospel. Put on the life of Christ. Be strong. Be strong. Let me the gospel truth for us to be strong is so important. But don't come out today thinking, I have to do, be strong for me. It's not about you. Be strong in the Lord. For those that may be listening, whether online or here, that you don't know Jesus Christ, hey, maybe, maybe you've sat back and you've listened to messages before and you're like, yeah, I don't know if I buy into this whole Christianity thing because, man, it doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to work. I still have problems. I still have struggles. It's because you're looking for the wrong thing. Wrap yourself up in the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's the power of God. So we invite you in this time. We invite you to step out. And in just a minute, we're going to have a song of invitation. And that invitation is we're inviting you to come and, and, and speak with someone, whether it's me or, or somebody else here that would make you feel comfortable. Let them show you from a gospel of Jesus Christ, from his word, how you can know Jesus Christ. Because that's what it comes down to. One simple thing. Either you know him or you don't. That's all we want. We're not asking for, you, for your money. We're not, asking for, uh, we don't, we're not asking for commitments or anything else like that. We're, we're actually giving Jesus away. That's what we want to do. I don't know why you wouldn't want him. For those of us here, though, I'd be honest with you, this is a message I told you at the very beginning. This is a message for Christians. So many Christians I see are struggling, struggling to make it. They're like the lot. I think the, the church of, of the 21st century is a lot like our, our guy Lot that we talked about today in Sunday school. Living in a dark, de deceitful place, all kinds of evil around him. He's a little flickering light. Yeah, the Bible says that Lot was righteous. He may have looked better than his, his people around him, but you know what? He still wasn't connected with God. He still messed out on a lot of things, and his family paid the price for it. He paid the price for it. 
What God would have wanted from Lot is what he wants for you. Wrap yourself up in Jesus Christ. Oh, Lot had a lot of stuff, material stuff. He was one of those guys. He could get what he wanted. He lived in a cool home. He had family. He had relationships. He had lots of friends, man. They were knocking on his door. He sat at the, te- at the gate of the city. Everybody recognized Lot. He had everything he thought was, was good, but he didn't wrap himself up in the life of Christ. Lot had to flee for his life. Tragic story there. Tragic story. And a lot of us, we still feel the mold of Lot because we're wrapped up in our, our friends. We're wrapped up in all the things of this world. But we haven't wrapped ourselves up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how about a Christian? I mean, we could have gone through the arm of God and talked about those things. Those are just places that Paul's identifying or places in our lives that we ought to cover up with God's gospel, the life of Christ. So where is it that you're vulnerable? Because Satan will know. You don't have to tell me. You already know. In fact, I wouldn't tell anybody. Because Satan's listening. He's designing plans to make you fail. He wants to see your destruction. He's targeted you. He wants to see your marriage collapse. So he's going to let you be a backbiter to your spouse. He's going to let you say nasty things about them. He's going to let you be unthankful unlovable. He's going to let you not talk your husband up. He's going to let you not love your wife the way you should, guys. That's what he's going to do. And you're going to fall, walk right into the schemes because you're going to walk with the world instead of wrap yourself up in God. Stand strong. Be strong. How about it? You put too much emphasis in the things of this world? Don't let those things trap you and knock you down. Whatever it is, why don't you today make a vow like, God, I want to wrap myself up in prayer. I want to wrap myself up in the the word of God, the the spirit of God. I want faith, my faith to grow stronger. And so I I need faith that only you can give me. It's not your faith you're building. It's God's faith in you. What is it? Maybe today's the day you got to get real with God and say, God, God, I want to stand up for once in my life. I want to stand up. I don't want to keep getting knocked down. So help me to be serious about wrapping myself up in you, in your spirit. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how Paul lays it out to us and how serious it is because Satan is our enemy and he's out to attack us. And even today, we're going to have attacks on our lives that that we aren't going to be ready for because we're not uh, expecting to skirmish. We don't understand that we're going to struggle in our Christian lives. We don't understand that you want us to succeed. You want us to stand. You want to give us the strength but we keep trying to do it in our own strength. So help us, God. I pray for each one of these people here. I pray for myself, that you would strengthen each one of us. Help us to wrap ourselves up because the gospel is the power of God in my life. And that's the only thing I can call count on to work in my life. So God, help us to rely on you, to clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ, to be filled with the mind of Christ, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing a verse of invitation. Draw me close to you. That's what we should be doing. Draw close to God. Wrap yourself up in the gospel as we sing. Draw me close to you. And never let me go.
when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus King of endless world no one could express how much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus, when it's all about you, 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 it's all about you. As we continue to worship this morning, uh, a verse, uh, a verse in Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it, it reads in that verse, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. What this verse reminds us of, it's a great reminder that we shouldn't focus on ourselves, but focus on others. And that's what this verse is about. Focusing on others, and then a benefit to that is the great joy in giving. That's why we give. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for all that you do give to us, Father. But right now we talk about and we pray about our gifts, our offerings, our tithes to you, Father. Father, may everything given today just go to your kingdom and your kingdom alone, Father, that it might grow. Father, that our community sees our giving. Father, that the world might see our giving, Father. What a blessing, Father. Lead us and guide us in that, Father. 
And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue to worship. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. When every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I do have a few announcements, but first of all, searching for that better life, searching for a better life. And he did mention that next week is the last week. Uh, and next week, reversing the curse. Uh, he has done a really good job on some of these titles. Uh, I, I'm just excited to hear that. But next week will be the last one of the sermon series. If you've missed any part of the sermon series, hey, remember you can always go to our YouTube channel or to our uh, 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 website and see the see this in the the entirety of the whole series. Or you can even go back and see some of the other series from our past. Uh, but reverse the curse next week. Uh, as far as announcements, there is uh, several that I do need to make mention of. Don't forget this month, as, food, as far as the food pantry, it is canned corn. But I'll go ahead and give you an insight into next month. It is uh, canned diced uh, tomatoes. That's going to be for the food pantry again. And also, considering the food pantry, uh, they're having their, their annual uh, breakfast uh, March, uh, March 23rd. It's over at First Baptist here in Seagrove. Uh, and in order to get those breakfasts, hey, bring in some canned goods is what they're asking for. Uh, but again, that's March 23rd. March 23rd is going to be a busy day because that day also is more than likely going to be the day that we're handing out the Easter food boxes uh, for the needy. Uh, we have, uh, uh, and the, the awesome thing about this, this is completely free as far as charge for us. It's something that Mountain Air does. Um, they're giving us 50 boxes, and it's a dinner ready to go. It's it's ready to be cooked. Uh, so we'll be handing those out that day, the 23rd. So what I need from you, first of all, pray towards that. Also, if you have anybody that needs boxes, hey, let us know, and I'll get them to you so you could take them uh, uh, to them people. Uh, but be praying towards that. Also coming up March 8th and 9th, uh, it's the Teen Extreme where we're going to be taking the youth uh, to Greensboro. Uh, it's a, it's, it's, I would say it's an overnight thing, but that makes it sound like you're going to sleep. Uh, there's no sleeping. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty much like a lock-in where we start at Prolific Park and then end up at a, at a bowling alley and finishing out the night or the morning, whatever you want to say. Uh, bowling, laser tag, and arcades and stuff. Uh, if you're interested in that or you know somebody that might be interested, make sure you're here tonight. I have the paperwork uh, because there is some waivers that you need to sign uh, for that. Uh, also, don't forget this evening, we will be having a business meeting. Uh, again, that's this evening uh, right before uh, the, the adult Bible study here and the, the youth down in the fellowship hall, the business meeting. 
Uh, and uh, uh, as far as mission, mission outreaches, a couple things. I've mentioned it several times, and y'all have absolutely exploded with this. So I'm going to continue mentioning it. Uh, if you will, when you leave today, when you go on Facebook on your phone and you see today's message, if you could do a couple things. First of all, comment on that, then also share that. Uh, so uh, uh, the word of God can get out to the masses. Uh, you'd be surprised how many views that we have because of you. Uh, it's 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 awesome to see the amount of views that we have on the sermons uh, when you do that. Uh, so continue to do that. Also, uh, standing rule: uh, if you don't see somebody that normally sits around you or close to you, if you don't see them, contact them this week. Uh, whether it's a text, whether it's a phone call, uh, what have you, however you want to do it, or, or better yet, go to them and, 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 and just visit. Uh, what an opportunity that you have there. But if you don't see them, uh, reach out to them. Uh, and also, men's breakfast next Sunday. I almost forgot, Bob. Men's breakfast is next Sunday. Hey, if you have any questions about the men's ministry, all the different things that they do, hey, see Brother Bob uh, before you leave today. And also, ladies, with all the different ministries with the ladies, if you'll see Miss Sander before you leave. Uh, with that said, uh, I do have uh, a bit of good news. Uh, I know we always end with our with a prayer and, and the prayer request. And if you don't have a, uh, uh, this, this month's prayer guide, Make sure you grab one, but one that's been on our prayer list for several months now, uh, Seth Lucas. Uh, he has been in the hospital several days. I talked to Miss Hannah uh, right before service, and, and she was saying that he's on his way home. Well, I got a text from Annette during service. They're at home. Uh, so uh, he has finished his treatments, uh, the chemo uh, and the radiation. He's done with the treatments. But I'm not going to lie to you, his body is, is, is battered, uh, to, say, to say the least. So be praying for him. Be praying for the family. Uh, I'll go ahead and warn you, today's probably not going to be the greatest day for visiting uh, because he is, like I said, his body is battered right now. But be praying for him. Uh, and most of all, be praying for each other. Uh, that's what the church is here for, to pray for one another. So let's do that. Father, we do thank you. Father, we thank you for today's service. Father, we thank you for, for the message. Father, we thank you for this series that we've been through. Uh, Father, searching for a better life. Father, we thank you for this series, Father, and we thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for just the opportunity to come together as family today to worship you. What an awesome experience, Father, and we thank you. Now, Father, I ask that you be with us as we leave out today. Father, as we, as we go about our different ways, as we go about this week, Father, wherever you take us, Father, lead us and guide us. Whatever we're doing, Father, lead us and guide us. Father, whatever comes out of our mouths, Father, lead us and guide us. Lead us and guide us as we leave today, Father. And we ask all this in Christ's precious and most powerful name. Amen.